millions and millions of years ago and millions of light years away in a galaxy that even today we could never hope to reach there was a planet called Cybertron on the Cybertron there was intelligent life but not life as we know it the planet was populated with sophisticated robots who could think and feel and transform themselves into individual fighting machines or combine into single powerful warrior robots and fight they did because the cities of Cybertron were inhabited by two distinct groups the peace-loving Autobots and their enemies the evil Decepticons who were driven by a single goal total domination so the evil Decepticons set out to destroy the peace-loving Autobots who had no alternative but to fight back as the forces of good against those of evil as war raged across Cybertron it devastated all in its path gradually draining the planet of all its sources of energy because both sides needed massive supplies of power to fuel and fire their highly advanced engines and weapons as the energy supplies dwindled the Autobot leader Optimus Prime realized that the only way to triumph over evil was to travel beyond the rarefied atmosphere of Cybertron and go in search of new forms of energy. And so it was, all those years ago, that in desperation aboard their spaceship, the Ark, the Autobots blasted off from Cybertron. Unbeknown to them, the coming Decepticons had followed, thinking that the Autobots would lead them to these new energy sources. After using up most of their power to put up a laser shield to cut a path through a giant meteorite storm, the Ark was at the mercy of the Decepticons who pressed home their advantage, clamping magnetic junctions onto the Ark before boarding the spaceship, in the confines of which violent hand-to-hand -hand contact took place, but to no avail. Both forces of good and evil were at the mercy of the forces of gravity. G-forces dragged the Ark down, out of control, plunging down into a strange planet, finally crashing into a barren mountainside. And there it stayed, undisturbed, undiscovered, and seemingly dead, dead, dead. Nothing stirred aboard the Ark. No trace of life. That is, until four million years later, when that mountain proved to be a volcano. As it erupted with the force of molten lava bubbling below its surface, the heat it gave off provided enough energy to breathe life into the dormant spaceship. The control console spluttered into life and emitted a beam of cybertronic energy into the bridge. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was a Decepticon who was in the path of its regenerating rays, the leader, Megatron. He heard the instruction of explore, explore, as a probe flew out to scour the territory outside the craft and report back. It was Megatron who also heard the instruction repair, repair. repair when enough energy had been sourced. And for once, he was happy to obey, as one by one he maneuvered his men in front of the energy-giving rays. <laughs> when all the Decepticon team was assembled, they took their first look at the world outside, a world very different from that of Cybertron, but one you or I would easily recognize as Earth. True? It was a planet very different to their own, but it made no difference to the evil Decepticons. Their mission still remained the same. Megatron's voice boomed around the landscape. This is a land of rich resources. We can return home with that power to build the ultimate weapon. Then, then we can conquer the universe. No one can stand in our way. And with that, he gave a throat-rasping laugh and strode off, taking his first mighty steps on Earth. 
The other Decepticons followed the example of their leader and cackled, all except the evil, aggressive Starscream, who turned and blasted away part of the mountainside with his electronic pulse gun to create an avalanche. <laughs> avalanche that would bury the spaceship and the Autobots, leaving the deadly Decepticons free to wreak havoc and devastation upon Earth, allowed to roam unchecked because Earthlings were powerless against such evil forces. However, there was one ray of hope, and surprisingly that ray of hope was due to the laser rays of Starscream's gun. Starscream's rash behavior, instead of burying the Autobots, had re-energized the craft. Awoken Optimus Prime, who, with the help of Sideswipe and Ratchet, had begun to revive his forces of good. The Autobots, too, soon realized that the land was full of energy. And as they moved further afield, they found evidence that the Decepticons had ravaged these sources with no fear of the consequences, no thought of the lives of the humans of the planet. No thought for anyone but themselves, their evil mission, their greed, their lust for power, total domination. The rest is history, how the fortunes of their war swung backwards and forwards across the planet. But their stay on Earth had begun to affect them all. Cracks had appeared in the Decepticon ranks. Starscream's lust for complete power, the desire to usurp Megatron's leadership, had led him to spend more time on furthering his own cause, rather than helping in filling and collecting valuable energy, wastefully firing on any target that took his fancy. Frequently reprimanded by Megatron for such infantile behavior, Starscream took to exploring on his own, plotting his takeover of power, regretting the time that he'd had his chance to assassinate Megatron, but had failed. It was during one of these solo sorties that Starscream landed on a remote Pacific island, his sonic sensors having revealed metal objects of considerable density deep in the jungle. As he neared the untidy mass of metal, vines and undergrowth, he let out a yell of delight. Here they were the ideal opportunity for him to build his very own fighting unit, military vehicles. The Energon Cube Starscream had managed to hide away during the confusion of the Autobot attack on the Burma Ruby Mines would now come in useful to transform these vehicles into a new Pacific Army of evil Decepticons. The Combaticons. With Onslaught, their commander, scheming, planning, with the patience you'd expect of a missile trailer. But when roused, what firepower he has. Next, Blastoff, who prefers to soar through outer space in his space shuttle mode. Aristocratic, aloof, and alone. From above the Earth's atmosphere, he can fire powerful X-ray lasers from his nose cone, raining destruction on targets 12,000 miles away. By contrast, Vortex, the helicopter, transfixes Autobots with a semi-automatic glue gun in robot mode before transforming and taking them on 300 miles per hour dizzying stunt flights, a most effective means of interrogation. The munitions expert, Swindle, is easygoing and streetwise. It is unusual for a jeep to prefer to make deals rather than war, but Swindle is a one-robot black market driven purely by greed. Last, but certainly not least, Brawl. The blustering, belligerent tank, built to be wild, shooting 200-pound TNT shells and 300 decibel bursts of concentrated sound energy. Everything about Brawl is loud, moving, talking, and of course, fighting, in which he is fearless. Five Combaticons that would transform and combine into the fearsome Bruticus, instilled with the violent, criminal personality of Starscream.
As they left the Pacific Basin with Air Commander Starstream, he chuckled to himself and muttered under his breath, Now, let Megatron try and stand in my way to become leader. <laughs> The reason Starscream had been able to get away with all this underhand activity was that Megatron had been concentrating on building his own forces in an effort to overpower the Autobots once and for all. After all, he had nearly managed to persuade the Autobots' new allies, the Aerial Bots, to join him. That would have been some coup. A real one in the power train for Optimus Prime, who had originally requested them as reinforcements from Cybertron. These aerial bots had been created on Cybertron by Vector Sigma, the mega computer which gives all Transformers life. However, because of the lack of energy that still persisted on Cybertron, a sudden power drop in the generator when they were being created meant that there was a slight fault in the aerial bot brain pattern, an element of unpredictability. This was the reason that shortly after they were brought to Earth to bolster the Autobot struggle, they had defected to the Decepticon ranks, lending considerable air power to the cause of evil. With Silverbolt, their leader, a sleek aerodynamic jet that strips electrons from air molecules as he flies, storing them to fire as powerful bolts of electricity. Then there's Air Raid, whose robot mode torque rifle can warp and break most materials. But it is in jet mode that Air Raid loves to enjoy himself. His wild-eyed, devil-may-care surprise raids proving effective, but above all, fun. In complete contrast to Air Raid's impetuosity is the studious, bookish Skydive, who would rather read about jet fighters than be one. His cerebral circuitry that gives him total recall of any maneuver after seeing it for only one millisypersecond, making him the most skilled flyer of the team which is more than can be said of Fireflight, whose love of the visions he sees from the skies makes him a menace. Fireflight has a sense of wonder about the world, while all the other aerial bots wonder how he manages to fly and survive at all, especially Slingshot, who, as a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, is the most maneuverable and the best shot. Unfortunately, he never stops bragging about such powers. No matter which side they were on, both Megatron and Optimus Prime, from past experiences, viewed the aerial bots with some apprehension. But despite the chinks in their mental armor, neither could deny that they were a fighting force to be reckoned with. Megatron sighed when he thought of what might have been if only the aerial bots hadn't returned to the Autobots' ranks, if only they... But then, life is full of if-onlys. Slowly, Megatron's pained expression spread into an evil grin. Little did Optimus Prime realize that he, Megatron, had already compensated for the loss of the Aerobots and the invincible Superion. But the Autobots would discover his new secret weapon soon enough. Just then, his reverie was broken into by Teletran breaking in, relaying a special news flash. The danger of landslides caused by the heavy rainfall is so acute that the area around the Pullen power plant has been evacuated. There's not a human being within a ten mile radius of the plant. Ah, now here was an ideal opportunity to gain more energy with no irritating interference by the humans. He stood and summoned Dirge, Thrust, Ramjet, Blitzwing, Rumble and Starscream. Where on earth is Starscream? demanded Megatron, screaming himself. We haven't seen him for mega days, chorus the Decepticons. We've not heard from him since he returned from Cybertron with the Stunticons, ventured Dirt. Silence! commanded Megatron. I told you never to mention them. You never know who's around or listening. The puny Autobots will find out about them soon enough. Just then, a communication came in from Starscream. Hello, Megatron. I've been busy, he remarked smugly. Want to know what I've been doing? I haven't got time to play your silly game, Starscream. Rendezvous with us, Pat. And Megatron gave the coordinates for a well-hidden spot, 20 Earth miles from the Pullen power plant. 
It'll, It'll be, be a, a pleasure. pleasure, said Starscream sarcastically, a pleasurable surprise. Maybe he wouldn't have said that if he had known what was happening at that very moment at the Pullen power plant. The television broadcast was right. All human beings had been evacuated, but there was plenty of activity from the plant. Autobot activity. In front of Prime was an equally large Autobot. Defensor, said Prime. You protector bots are a new but very important team of the defense of this planet. So, transform. Defensor obeyed, and suddenly there was an odd assortment of Earth vehicles at Prime's feet. Except these were well armed with powers not normally associated with such vehicles and known to the Autobots by different names. Hotspot, the fire engine, a natural and inspirational leader who believes in operating at full throttle every moment of his life, using his immense strength for the fall. A quality that Blades, the police helicopter, does not have. But he more than compensates for that with his lust for battle, often being heard to say, War's a dirty game, and I'm a dirty player. Streetwise, the patrol car is equally keen and determined. Nothing deters him from intercepting his prey, not even alien environments, because he takes everything in, languages, dialects, maps, and mentally files the information for future reference. Groove, the patrol bike, is highly maneuverable, but prefers the open road and an easy life, being more of a pacifist than a warrior. First aid is compassionate and cautious, like all medical people, appreciating that prevention is better than cure, but sometimes he's overcautious in looking after the well-being of any machine. Prime left the protector bots to keep the plant free from Decepticons while the rest of the area was evacuated, safe in the knowledge that protector bots are never off duty and that they are well disguised for the task ahead. Meanwhile, 20 Earth miles away, the Decepticons were gathering. Let's, Let's attack, attack straight away. away. Take, Take everyone, everyone by surprise, surprise, urged Rumble. No. no. Wait, Wait, Megatron. You're getting as impatient as Starscream. In fact, where is Starscream? No Decepticon appeared to know. Never mind, said Megatron. We haven't got time to worry about him now. We can get on with our attack without him. Ah, but what if the Autobots and Aerobots are gone in the plant? asked Ramjet. What do you mean, if? sneered Megatron. Those goody-goody friends of Earth flesh are bound to be there. But we can get close to the plant and catch them unawares because they've never seen the Stunticons before. We can play the Autobots at their own game only faster and nastier. And so the Stunticons raced off along the road to the plant. First the truck trailer, Motormaster, their leader, cold, cruel, and self-appointed king of the road, killing anything in his path by collision or crushing. Next, King Dragstrip, fast, furious, and furtive. He can hover on a cushion of compressed air, but prefers to be hurtling into battle with the Autobots, which is more than can be said for dead end. He is more concerned with the appearance of his Porsche paintwork than continuing the Transformers' war. Next came Wild Rider, the Ferrari. 30 miles per hour faster than Dead End, and whereas Dead End is fatalistic, Wild Rider is playing fatal, an absolute motor menace who exults in the accidents he causes. Past Wild Rider, Dead End, Dragstrip and Motormaster came breakdown, having preferred to hide behind the other Stunticons because of his nervous disposition and persecution complex. Breakdown went scouting ahead, glad for an open road away from prying eyes. On another road, Optimus Prime was driving north away from the plant to check on the rest of the Autobots clearing the area before returning to the Ark when he passed a military convoy heading towards the plant. He thought it odd, then thought no more of it. If only he'd known that here were Starscream's Combaticons, he'd have been taken by surprise. But surprises were to be many that fateful day. Back at the plant, 
First aid and hotspot continued their sweeping patrols of the perimeter on the ground. Blaze was hovering above. He was in this police helicopter mode that he alerted the other protector bots to the oncoming odd entourage of Ferrari, Porsche and drag car who were burning up the sudden approach road to the plant. Perhaps they're human danger lovers, said Groove. Well, we better warn them that they're in real danger of being overtaken by the landslide, said Blades. And as he did so, he moved in to take a closer look at these fast, flashy cars and suddenly realized it was themselves who were in danger from... Deceptic arms, he yelled. All five protector bots raced to meet this threat. As they were about to transform, so Motor Master's voice boomed out, Stand, Stand aside, aside Autobots, Autobots. you're old and headed for the scrap heap. I am Motor Master, and we are the Stunticons. We combine. On that instruction, he reared up, transformed into the Decepticons' new secret weapon, the mighty Menasaur. The Protector Bots were surprised, but as Menasaur threatened them with all sorts of pain to their exhaust pipes and camshafts, it was soon his turn to be surprised as the Protector Bots combined to form one huge robot, Defensor. But the surprises didn't stop there. There was more activity down the northern perimeter. Onslaught, Brawl and Swindle, two-thirds of Starscream's secret army arrived into the battle arena. There was activity in the air, too, as Silverbolt and other aerial bots, alerted by Optimus Prime back at the Ark, flew into the area. Suddenly, their flight path was crossed by a flash of dark green. Wow! What was that, Silverbolt air radar? The space shuttle, an SS-125 class to be precise, piped up skydive. I'm not so sure, said Air Raid, as he looped around it. Silver Bolt! Silver Bolt! He screamed as he dived underneath the so-called space shuttle. It's got a Decepticon badge! Too late, you treacherous aerial boss, said Blastoff scornfully. But the scorn was short-lived, as Onslaught commanded him to transform quickly to join him. Vortex, Brawl and Swindle to form Bruticus. The Decepticon badge spotted on Blastoff meant that now it was known on whose side the Combaticons were to fight. The side of evil. Get your warrior robot carcass over here, yelled Menasaur to Bruticus as he launched another attack on Defensor. Quick, before those turncoat aerial bots get in on the action. Too late, you Pacific pieces of tin, replied Silverbolt, as the aerial bots in the transform mode of Superion leapt to the side of Defensor. The ground trembled. Mighty Menasaur packing 140 tons of punch and Bruticus, a 14,000 pounds per square inch punch, both rushed to get into close quarters, hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Autobots. Defensor, attempting to keep them at bay, fired a 2,000 degree fireball cannon at Menasaur. You might as well flick matchsticks at me, said Menasaur scornfully without even halting in his stride. Don't you all the bots realize I'm immune to artillery? Try this, the size then, menace or mouth, yelled Superion, as he caught him a formidable blow of the sort that could demolish a battleship. But this was no battleship. It was Menasaur, who, although momentarily stunned, clanked forward to vent his rage on Superion. Defensor by now had clashed with Bruticus. They were locked together, each trying to lift the other to gain an advantage but they were evenly matched. Optimus Prime watched from the Ark, not wishing to throw the other Autobots into the fray until the area had been successfully evacuated. But he needn't have worried. Superion had just fired his stress fracture cannon at the enraged Menasaur, and it had located the area damaged by his original punch and caused it to fracture. But still, he advanced. Except by now, he was getting confused reports from the Stunticons dead end and breakdown who were worried about any further injury and were all for running right then but Menasaur was having none of it. Prove you first, he yelled. Get, Get your sonic stun gun end over here. Bruticus turned and in doing so gave defense of the half chance he wanted and he dealt him an almighty protector pot blow. Seeing this, Starscream, who had the sense to keep out of harm's way until now, ordered Bruticus to concentrate on destroying Defensor. Bruticus, already reeling from Defensor's blow, 
now reeled further, not knowing which order to obey. In total confusion, he paused. That was his last mistake. Defensa had no time to reflect on this fleeting victory, as Starscream was now unleashing cluster bombs and null rays at him. The Defensa had enough time to surround himself with a force field. Superior, he yelled. You get after Starscream. I'll deal with Menasaur. Aerial bots, transform, ordered Silverbot. And soon, Starscream was flying at a speed of Mach 2.8 away from the power plant, just managing to outpace Air Raid and Sky Dive, who watched his flight skills with admiration. On the ground, Menasaur, realizing his fighting power was seriously reduced, and that two of his weaker limbs had more than enough damage for one day, ordered the Stunticons to transform and disperse. Defense's limbs, too, were feeling heavy, and the storm around the plant was getting worse, so Blades would be unable to fly in the strong winds. Groove unwilling, Streetwise too slow, and Hotspot, well, for Hotspot, there was still work to do at the plant, and no doubt First Aid wouldn't let him chase the stunty cons without a checkup. Aboard the Ark, Optimus Prime permitted himself a smile. The Protector Bots may be a new team, but they were a better team than those of the Decepticons. The aerial bots had performed outstandingly, too. It was a good day for the forces of good. But deep in the back of his cerebral circuit, there was one nagging doubt. Sure, they had won today's battle, but had they won the Transformers' war? Where was Megatron? And why had not he added his weight to the battle? And... Had the Autobots really put the Decepticons to flight for good? <laughs>